You know, they're, they're selling you all wolf tickets, people. You're eating them right up. Hey, pussy, are you still there? I back. Trust me. I back. But uh, I'm not impressed by your performance. You do nothing. You do nothing. Shut your fucking mouth. You do nothing. You do fucking nothing. Now, Woody is a do nothing. I'll tell you what, you know, I'll tell you what, bro. You know, I was out there. I was fighting all the hitters, bro. You ain't fought no hitters. Come on, guys. Normal. I'm not, I'm not saying I would fight you. I, I would kill you. John, do you think, do you, so, so, John, do you think I'm just going to sit there and let you kill me, John? I mean, really. No, no, don't be scared, homie. I'd like to take this chance to apologize to absolutely nobody. The double chance does what the fuck he wants. I am going to beat you into the living death. Maybe that's your, that's your job, but where I come from, you know, people like that get slapped. That's fucking illegal. <laughs> Nick Diaz, you just shook up the world. How's that feel? Hey, I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. Yeah, this is a simulated death match. And you haven't simulated anybody's death yet. I said it last year. We're not here just to take part. We're here to take over. What is the game plan going out against him? The game plan is you go in there, hit him with some good shit, don't get hit, and uh, come home with a pocket full of cash. Who the fuck is that guy? Everybody's on steroids. The whole UFC, everybody. I'm gonna go home tonight. I'm gonna drink a Coors Light. That's a Coors Light because Bud Light won't pay me nothing. Do you want to be a fighter? That is my question. Any of you radio personalities think you want smoke? Call me Mr. Chimney. I want smoke. Yes, yes, yes. What is up? What is up? MCR family, another daily edition of Mixed Combat Radio live on YouTube, obviously podcast form. Uh, you know, wherever you can find podcasts. iTunes, Spotify, Heart Radio, Podcast Addicts, uh, Spreaker, Blog Talk, anywhere you find podcasts, you can find, obviously, Mixed Combat Radio. Obviously... This was supposed to be the Monday review show where we, where we just review all of the weekend's action. And if there's any, you know, sort of ancillary, ancillary news, we get to it. But, of course, uh, the Mayweather, you know, explosion had to happen. And, obviously, that is just going to be a massive part of the news. Floyd Mayweather versus Tension Nasakawa in Ryzen FF in Japan, New Year's Eve. Obviously, major breaking news just in all of the combat sports world. Um, definitely going to delve into that one in a lot of different ways. A lot of different threads uh, we can sort of needle uh, in this story because there's so much going on here. It, it's another cross-sport uh, matchup. It's one that obviously if... a lot for Obviously, most people in the U.S., especially boxing fans, aren't really, you know aware of the Japanese A, MMA scene, or really just the Japanese boxing scene as a whole. Um, the unaware of Tenshin Nasakawa, the, you know, that's not a name they know, even though he may be a massive prodigy out in Japan. Um, you know, obviously my audience in, in this show, it's predominantly U.S. and U.K. audience. This is a matchup with a lot of sort of uh, history behind it, not necessarily with these two guys, but just the placement of this, the timing of it, it New Year's Eve in Japan, boxer versus uh, kickboxer. This is a fight that goes down in a long line of fights like it in this area in this specific time of the year. Um, one that I, I, I'm going to touch on briefly as I sort of, you know, sort of thread one of those um, parts of the story. Uh, obviously, though, let's get sort of get to it. Uh, but before we do, hit the like button, share the show, subscribe. Uh, I already see some trolls over there uh, hitting the thumbs down. It's okay, guys. Like, it, it, I know the fight's not a fight that you're happy about, but it's a fight that we have to talk about, unfortunately. Uh, so definitely go hit that like button, share the show, subscribe, listen on podcast form, drop that review. Uh, shout out to Dwayne and Juan uh, David Hernandez in the chat. I know this is late. Um, also, I want to sort of touch on this. Um, I know this is you know a few hours after our usual uh, scheduled time. Uh, there was a you know doctor's appointment I had to attend for a family member. Um, you know any sort of prayers and thoughts out there is always helpful uh, for my family right now. Don't really want to delve into it, um, but digressing from that, that's why I'm late today. I apologize. It's another reason I'm probably gonna be late uh, next Monday as well, and the Monday after that, 
but after that, we should be fine. There shouldn't be any more um, sort of disturbances in the schedule, the regular schedule, uh, as you guys are, are accustomed to. Uh, but as for all the, the housekeeping inside, let's get to the news of the day. And the, after the news of the day, obviously this Mayweather news, we're going to delve into the fights and review them in its entirety. And then uh, obviously... You know, head out of here, take your calls, 323-870-4051, press 1 to get in the queue. If you're international and want to call in, email me, mixedcombatradio at gmail.com to get a free international permanent call-in link. But again, that number, 323-870-4051, press 1 to get in the queue. Definitely want uh, some opinions uh, about this matchup. Dwayne, uh, Juan, uh, I'm a kid. Definitely call in, uh, guys, because it's going to be one I want a lot of opinions about because this is such a polarizing news story so uh definitely want all sorts of opinions and takes about it but let's get to the actual news and how it sort of transpired and um sort of the timeline of it because obviously we knew that floyd in japan was a possibility right that's not something that is out of left field in any way um there's that whole uh, occurrence where uh pacquiao and floyd ran, in, ran into each other at a japanese nightclub sean gibbons Shout out to John, Sean Gibbons. What an interesting guy. Um, they were all there. They sort of announced that he was going to take a tune-up in uh, Japan in New Year's Eve and then fight Pacquiao next year. So it being in Japan, it being New Year's Eve, not really the most surprising part of the story. I think we can all sort of say about that. However, about, what was it, 21 hours ago, 21 hours ago, uh, Mayweather went to Instagram and posted this on his page. Um, it was a picture, if you listen to the podcast, it's a picture of him uh, with Ryzen FF MMA gloves on. Ryzen FF is a MMA promotion just like the UFC, Strike Force, Pride, um, Bellator, uh, uh, One Championship, etc. And with the caption, December 31st, 2018, hashtag Tokyo. And instantly when I saw this... <laughs> I, I was confirmed. Uh, no, sorry, not confirmed. I was I was worried um, about what was happening. Um, this definitely seemed the rising part of it. The MMA gloves attached to it all seemed just shocking. Let's be completely honest. Um, attached to that, there was a, uh, a press conference that happened. I I'm not gonna play any of the audio. Just any sort of worried uh, about copyright uh, reasons. But definitely go check it out. There's tons of outlets that have. Uh, the media uh, media press conference um, to sort of get a better idea of it, perhaps. Um, but yes, Floyd Mayweather to make his debut uh, with Ryzen FF December 31st, uh, most likely in the Saitama Super Arena in Saitama, Japan, which is about a half hour drive outside Tokyo. It would be like Anaheim to LA, if anyone were out there, or maybe like Jersey to Manhattan in any sort of way. I'm actually like the Barclays to MSG, let's be honest, with New York traffic. Um, and fighting tension, Nasakawa. Obviously, a lot of people are sort of asking two things. A, what are the rules of this? We do not know. Um, there's zero information about that. I can only tell you what I have been hearing, um, what the rumor is out there, what the whispers are, which is, again, this is pure speculation on from a lot of people. Three, three-minute rounds, exhibition, boxing, with MMA gloves on which is why it would not count for any sort of uh, uh, pro-sanctioning body or amateur body because uh, it would be with MMA gloves and it would be boxing rules. Um, that is the rumor at this point. Now, Tenshin Nasakawa, a guy that maybe, obviously, a lot of people do not know, he is a prodigy. Like, Let's not get it twisted here. Even though he's a 122-pounder, he is 20 years old, he is an insane freak prospect. Undefeated in kickboxing, undefeated in MMA, um, already cross sport talent. So he's a legit, uh, you know, guy. I would say not a legit opponent because obviously, if this is just pure boxing rules, Mayweather is twenty to thirty pounds bigger, uh, and plus, obviously, has the experience and skill, right? Like, let's not get it twisted in that aspect. However, um, I would definitely say that. That even though this is a case of obviously a huge mismatch, and obviously we can delve into more of the Japanese aspect of it and why that is the case, it is um, huge moment for tension. 
Like, I, I will give it up to him. Like, win or lose, this is boosting his stock. Win or lose, this is boosting Ryzen's stock. Um, Tension Nasakawa, obviously going to be the, the butt of a lot of jokes, which is sad because, honestly speaking, he is up there with Inoue. He is up there with Kenshiro. He is up there with uh, Tanaka. He is up there with some of these supreme prodigies out of Japan. He just so happens not to be in the sport that a lot of my listeners happen to love, which is boxing. He's in. He's a kickboxing prodigy. He's making the transition over to MMA at only 20 years old. He's been, he's been pro since 15, 16 years old. This kid is an insane talent. And again, even though we all assume he's going to lose this fight, huge for his profile. Um, this fight is already going to be seen. I mean, tension is already seen by millions of people. Tension is already sort of a, a, a slight mega star in Japan. Maybe not to the NOA level, but definitely I would say, I would argue more than Kose Tanaka. I would make that argument. Uh, I might be wrong, but uh, I, I would definitely try to make that argument. However, obviously, you know, putting the mismatch aside, so we're getting to the sort of macro sense of this fight and the matchup in and Ryzen. Um, a lot of people I've seen out there worried about, not worried, but questioning, where is the money coming from? And very quickly, 404 number, I see you in the queue. I will get to you in a second. Do not worry. Just stay there. Stay tight. Um, I know a lot of boxing fans are not, you know, sort of aware of this. Some of my MMA listeners will be, so this might be your information that you already know. And unfortunately, that's just how it's going to have to be. Uh, but there's a lot of people that just don't know. Ryzen FF, Ryzen Fighting Federation, is a reborn version of Pride FC, Pride Fighting Championship. Pride Fighting Championship was a MMA promotion in the mid-90s all the way to the mid-2000s. Um, Saki, Saki Gabara, uh, I forget his first name, I apologize, uh, was one of the high-ranking execs and owners of Pride he is one of the owners of Ryzen FF. For those that do not know, Pride FC's demise was almost purely due to Yakuza. Yes, Yakuza, as in the Japanese uh, mafia, infighting uh, in between uh, Pride's execs. Sakibara being one of them. Um... All the execs at that company had ties or uh, either indirectly or direct ties, active members or non-active members of Yakuza gangs. And the infighting between them in result to Fuji TV's television deal results in Fuji TV no longer uh, picking up the product in 2006. Right after that, UFC bought up Pride and the rest is history. um, Yakuza infighting brought down pride and for those that don't understand pride uh definitely go check out this article the link is in the description Uh, so when you're done listening to the show go read this article by jonathan snowden a good colleague of mine title is called sex drugs gangsters and mma remembering pride ufc's wild predecessor and i'm gonna read a quick excerpt from it just so and again this is a huge article it's one of those that you really have to sit through and read it but i implore you to do it if you read this article, you will have not only a greater understanding of what's happening right now with Ryzen, but also overall in Japanese combat sports, both in boxing and not. Um, you know, when we talk about boxing back in the 40s and 50s and the connection with the mafia and the mob in the U.S., that is an, a daily occurrence today in Japan with the Yakuza. And let's not forget that. Uh, but quickly, I want to read this one excerpt uh, from Jonathan Snowden himself. It's not a quote from anyone else. It's just Jonathan Snowden in the article. It says, Celebrities, freak shows, and pro wrestlers share the, the stage with the best fighters in the world, and the result was something that could never be duplica- duplicated. It was an orgy of excess fueled by mafia money and legal steroids, a spectacle that was almost obscene in its grandeur. I think that's a really great synthesis of what Japanese combat sports is. It is sort of celebrities, freak shows, pro wrestlers, all combined with the best fighters in the world. Let's not get twisted here. Tenshin Nasakawa, one of the best kickboxers in the world. Anyway, one of the best boxers in the world. Kose Tanaka, one of the best boxers in the world. However, there has always been this influx. You can go back all the way 
to the 70s with Ali Anoki. When Muhammad Ali went over and they fought a pro wrestler in Anoki. That's all sort of sentence back from that. Go check out a book by, by Josh Gross if you can. Ali Anoki is sort of the, the Bible of that story. Um, a lot of pieces from that story connect to pride, connect to now rising. And it's a weaving piece of history that obviously is now very modern in our on our in our day. Um, and I may not be the best expert in really piecing it apart for, for you guys, the listeners. I, I know there's probably better people out there, but I at least want to make you guys aware of it, that there is this greater overarching sense of history with this matchup. Even though this matchup is a total farce in a, in a, in a showcase, in a circus fight, it is. It's all that. But in Japanese combat sports, that has been what, like their bread and butter. It just is. They've accepted it. The mafia there loves it. They feel it with their money. Um, it's just a different animal entirely compared to, let's say, the beasts between Top Rank and PBC and Golden Boy and HBO and Showtime. That is drastically subdued in terms of fighting, uh, dichotomy, um, you know, just influx in terms of a market, in terms of an industry, than Japanese combat sports. Uh, when we talk about the ebb and flow uh, of combat sports and its peaks and valleys, Japanese combat sports is an entirely different beast that with way greater peaks and way greater valleys. Um, but sort of to digress from that sort of overarching history sense of this event. Um, just going to be curious, obviously, if this uh, actually ends up happening. Mike Tyson was supposed to fight in Pride. Um, I know that might be like news for some boxing fans here, but Mike Tyson was supposed to fight in Pride, I think, in 2001, 2002-ish. Um, you know, so this has just always been the case. Like this, in a way, is obviously very shocking and also, in a lot of ways, isn't. Like, this shouldn't be surprising news. We should have sort of seen this coming in some ways. Maybe not this, the specific name of Tenshin Nasukawa, but this matchup in Japan, New Year's Eve, the Ryzen connection, the, the Saki Gabara connection, the Yakuza connection, this is all not surprising in any way, shape, or form. It just isn't. Um, also, sort of a, a last sort of a piece on this, which is just interesting to me. Floyd Mayweather, a guy that obviously we would all want him to end his career instead of fighting Andre Berta, Floyd, uh, Conor McGregor, and uh, Tenshin Asakawa, it would be Crawford, you know, Danny Garcia, Keith Thurman. It would be those names, right? We we all in agreement there. I don't think anyone really disagrees with that. However, it is just interesting that Mayweather is outside of boxing, fighting really like tough competition, if that makes sense. Like, in pro wrestling, he went and took on Big Show. And obviously, that's pro wrestling. That's not real. But it's he went on to took on Big Show, like, back in the day. That was that was a huge event. Went on took on Conor McGregor. At the time, I mean, who could make the argument that Conor McGregor wasn't at the very top of MMA? Um, and it obviously did huge buy rates. And now going on to Japan and fighting the best kickboxer right now. The best prodigy uh, that Japanese MMA has seen in... God, maybe over a decade, if not more. It's just interesting. It may not be uh, an accolade that means as much as his uh, wins over Oscar De La Hoya, Miguel Cotto, etc. But it, it's still an accolade. It's still something interesting that his outside of his outside boxing career and other combat sports, he sort of picked the best names. You know, for God, for for it being prize fighting at the end of the day. To take it to take prize fighting to its truest definition, he's done it right. He has. Um, I can be upset that he's not fighting guys like Crawford and Danny, but I can also respect the guy that's just trying to make money. Obviously, people are going out there and thinking that Floyd's broke. I don't know about that. Um, obviously, his spending habit is extreme, but also he makes more money than any other athlete in the world by an exponential figure. So, I don't know. I, I think that, that there may be some substance to that point, but it seems to me the, the least interesting point, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, I can see why that's a, that's a factor here. That's a thread in the story. But it's, one, it's a thread that I'm just purely disinterested in, to be quite honest. 
Um, before I head out to sort of reviewing uh, the rest of the re- weekend's action, because I really don't have much to say else about Mayweather versus uh, uh, Nasakawa, I think it's vaguely interesting. Um, but then again, I'm a degenerate. Like, I I grew up in the Pride era, if that makes sense. I grew up in the the era of excess fueled by mafia money and legal steroids. I grew up in that spectacle that was obscene and grand. I grew up in it. That was my era that I became a combat sports fan. So I'm always going to be a little more accepting of these circus fights. If you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. That's the beauty of this market. Um, Even though I think, obviously, we can still be upset that we didn't see the end of Mayweather's career the way we want it to be. Um, But anyways, let's go to that 404 number. Um, Caller, who is this 404, and where are you calling from? Yeah, this is this is Naj. I'm in Atlanta. What's going on, man? What's up, Naj? How you doing? I'm good, man. Hey, and look, the, the the point you just said. I, I mean, yeah, that's well made. If you're talking about uh, all of these guys, Crawford and 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 Garcia and all this, they have to become bigger names. If they were bigger names, he would have happily taken the fight. But at this point. It's way more risk than it is reward. So, of course, that dude, of all dudes, is not going to take that fight. And, honestly, that, that's, that's all way back to the, to the 90s and the HBO-ization of boxing to where you couldn't afford to put on good contending fights. It was more important to keep your star uh, viable so you would put your star again against people he could easily beat. Or if you had a mega fight, it would go to PPB. So, I mean, that's, that's the boxing infrastructure. Uh, the Japanese point you made, uh, I agree with that one, too. And honestly, hell, our mafia organizations found that there was more money in real estate and other things. So they were able to walk away from combat sports. But uh, Pierce, there's habits. And I watched that pride stuff, too, man. You couldn't tell me Vandalay Silva could knock anybody out way back then, man. It was, it was a ridiculous spectacle. But, yeah, I watched it. And, you know, it was entertaining. But as far as this fight, dude, the, the devil's in the details. We got to see that contract. We have to see what is allowed or what is not allowed because there's no way in hell Floyd is stepping in there clean and getting his teeth kicked out with a kick. But, like, I, I think there's going to be some circumstances that make this fight less appealing. And the, the other part of this is how does Floyd actually promote the fight? Because, uh, you know, selling the villain role in Japan, he has to kind of dial it back a bit make them mad enough to want to see the fight, but it can't be the disrespectful nature of uh, putting shame on the country because they won't show up and they won't watch if you go too far uh, as far as, you know, just Japanese, the Japanese culturally, uh, there are certain things that they just do not allow. And, you know, you're not this big athletic phenom. You're the small defensive fighter who has gotten by on, you know, being the villain. But here he can't be the normalized, you know, villain that we're used to that sells fights here. He's going to have to be careful with that. But, but, but yeah, man, I, I want to see the contract details, bro. Well, the funny part is is that I don't, I don't think he really has to promote, promote it that much. A, I think he's probably going to get guaranteed money, knowing Floyd, and, and, know, mm-hmm. and knowing how Pride yeah. worked back in the day, knowing how kind of Ryzen works now. They give out huge guarantees. They don't really give out backroom, or as, as much as we know about. Uh, and they don't have pay-per-view. It's not a pay-per-view model in, in Japan. It's just different. So I, I see Floyd getting a huge guarantee, I see him thinking that this is just purely a tune-up. Like, it's an exhibition. That's that's the word I've been hearing a lot with this fight. An exhibition match. So I think he's going to come out here, <clears throat> and if you watch the press conference, he's going to come out here very respectful. He did it in the press conference. He was super nice and gracious to tension, you know, applauding him for being this huge prodigy in kickboxing, undefeated, all this stuff. So I think Floyd is going to be that, that elder statesman, I'm this legend in the sport, and... J- the Japanese culture is going to eat that up, regardless. Now, for here in the yeah. U.S., yeah, so, so, for, for, so for here in the U.S., of, I'm promoted. I got to big up this fighter, not I have to tear down this fighter or make myself a villain. Also, oh, I, I see what you're saying. Also, for here, in the, for here in the U.S., I don't think he really cares about it. Like, I don't think he cares about this fight. Like, doing anything in the U.S. T- to me, this is purely a cash grab for him to stay busy and stay mm-hmm. and stay active. And wait while Pacquiao's fighting Broner and see what happens with that. To me, that's the real big fish so, he's so, waiting for. Wait, wait a minute. The exhibition point you just made stands out, too. Do you think there's a chance that they get in there and it's kind of like a friendly, 
like you would call yes. it soccer or something. Yes. And it gets to the point where people are like, oh, this isn't what we thought it was. This is an exhibition of skills. And they're kind of, you know, not competing, but just like you said, putting on an exhibition. Like that. Me- remember, remember when, uh, that could change remember when Shaquille O'Neal fought Shane Mosley? Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Like, I, yeah, yeah. obviously, that was a, that was a, a very uh, extreme example of a size <laughs> difference. But this is a similar size difference. Like Mayweather's giant compared to tension, and this is just a boxing exhibition match with MMA gloves, uh, and for three rounds, three minutes. That's that's only nine minutes of action. That's it. That's all it is. Right. You know, this is going to be a a pure money grab, and it's going. I'm going to buy it still, but I mean, it is a money grab. You know, that's what it <laughs> seems. <laughs> right. I, I agree with you, man. And, and since you you know. You brought up the, I guess you could say, nefarious side of pride. Well, like, what what makes people think we're not going to see that same type of, you know, grifting all over again? Not because I'm trying to, you know, down their their particular fighting community. It's just the, the infrastructure is already in place. There are a lot of people who can make money. Who's more likely to hang around tough guys who have dreams of being a fighter as a, you know, as, as an adult? Like, yeah, it, it's kind of baked into the cake. You know what I'm saying? My my understanding of it, and I could be wrong about this, and definitely go check out the article uh, that's linked in the description that really details uh, pride and all of its uh, nefariousness in great detail. Definitely, you know, points mm-hmm. out names, faces that you need to know about, um, events that happen behind the scenes that just don't get talked about. People, you know, mysteriously vanishing or dying. You know, those are occurrences that happen under pride. The difference is that most of those people that f- were in fighting in pride, they're gone. Like the people that really challenge the, pe- the people that really challenge Sakibara are no longer there. He is really in firm control of Ryzen. Unlike Pride, even though he was the face of Pride in a lot of ways, he was not really the sole exec of Pride. There was a couple other names, and I, I'm not going to say their names. I may say I'm wrong. They're in that article that's linked in the description. Read it. Um, but those names are no longer here. That's sort of my understanding of it. So. Why I think maybe okay. Ryzen may not have the pitfalls of of Pride is because it's much more autocratic now with Ryzen. While in Pride, there was literally different factions of Yakuza in different boards and exec- executive rooms at Pride. Now it seems like there's only one so- gang. <laughs> uh, of, oh, there's only one faction of, of the Yakuza controlling Ryzen. Maybe a gross overalization, but so that's the same my sense of it. alphabet argument we've been making in boxing for 30 years, right? So basically, it's like, yeah, the thing we've been wanting, one top-down organization that actually is properly regulated and, and viewed as, as such. Well, in I mean... The NFL and the NBA or whatever. Well, the only... The only I mean, I wouldn't say that Ryzen's properly regulated. Um, Gabby Garcia's fighting <laughs> like 60-year-olds, man. Like, the Japanese MMA has never been regulated. <laughs> oh. Like Japanese I MMA is Jap oh. you know, Japanese MMA is not regulated. Like it may be autocratic and streamlined okay. in its uh, executive decisions, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the most fighter friendly organization. It may pay the right people the right amount, but it may not be overall for the greater majority the right thing. Hmm. Okay, I see. And and lastly, man, I, I just want to get this point in. Uh, when we see Pacquiao and we see Floyd and all this stuff, at a certain point, do we kind of have to say that MMA and football uh, took away a huge part of the talent pool that boxing used to draw from? And now because of that, some older fighters are actually able to fight, you know, at a, at a longer uh, age and that there's fewer and fewer stars, you know, coming up. But no matter what, boxing, they can always solve their problems with the correct star. But either way, I, I think the decline in boxing uh, from what we're seeing is because uh, people really don't like signing up to get punched in the face. And if you have a smaller talent pool, it's going to cause, you know, your talent to decline a bit. Um, no, I wouldn't really agree with that. Um, I wouldn't agree that MMA is, is any cause to why – you have athletes not being in boxing or, or supreme athletes, especially in the U.S. market, specifically talking about the U.S. market. The NFL, the NBA, MLB, they have always taken the best athletes of America away from combat sports. Now, for MMA, they tapped into an athletic base that was never tapped into, which is collegiate wrestlers. That was, a, that was, athle- mm-hmm. that was an athletic talent pool that was just never tapped into by the NBA, NFL, in any sort of capacity. 
but boxing never tapped right. into it as well. So it's not really that they took away people from boxing. It's just that they tap into a, a talent pool that really didn't have a pro sport on their side, if that makes any sense. No, that, that makes perfect sense. But my argument is not basically saying the UFC is pilfering them. I'm just saying those other athletic events, you know, just, just pulls people out of that. Remember, I grew up in the – well, put it like this. I grew up in the 90s. So there was a boxing gym or a few boxing gyms in every major city, same as pool halls. And when people started doing different stuff, those things disappeared. And, you know what I mean, the so-called sweet science is not being taught as much and there's not as many available pupils. So I, I think, you know, more than anything, that's just what it is, man. Uh, football, basketball, or, or anything else, if you lose out of your talent pool, you, you're going to see the results of that. Well, I mean, and you also, st- I mean, not com- I agree that the NFL and NBA and the major leagues have always taken away from boxing, but you've st- you talked about it in your call earlier about the the HBO's HBO HBOization of boxing, how the premium cable networks came in, and there was a paywall to the product. Now, uh, pay per view model mm. pay per view model came in, uh, obviously in the '90s. Those things changed the sport, and I think that probably had a more uh, major factor to the the amount of gyms that closed down, etc. That you saw that I still see today. Um, you're completely right about that. But I think it's more about that paywall. While for soccer, NFL, mm. or NBA, it's on Fox. It's on CBS. It's on NBC. Right. Um, those are very cheap sports to get into. To buy a soccer ball or an NFL ball or NFL you know, regulated uh, regulation ball, those are cheap things to buy. To buy headgear, uh, waist protector, uh, good gloves, hand wraps, all you know, boxing shoes... You're spending hundreds yeah. and hundreds of dollars. It's a very expensive sport to get into. Same with all of combat sports. Well, the, the only the only pushback I would have on that one would be these executives pretty much know what they're doing when it comes to viewership. And if the demand was there, then they would have kept it on ABC and all of those other outlets. But uh, the demand wasn't the same. We we essentially stood up to where we were only going to, for the mega fights where you can have a fight party, which, you know, still to this day, if there's a bad fight on, but I got an opportunity to have a fight party, I'll do it. I'll get a bad PPC <laughs> just to have people come, hang out, cook, and drink. You know, you know what we do. Uh, I, I agree. I agree with a lot of what you said, Nas. Uh, anything else? Yeah. No, that's it, man. Good good job on the show, and I'm going to check out that article. I appreciate it, man. appreciate it, man. Have a great day. Uh, heading over to uh, our co-host, Mr. Cameron Gillen over in the U.K. How are you doing, Cameron? What's going on, man? How's it going? Going good, man. Obviously, the whole Mayweather tension Nasakawa news is just dominating every Twitter. MMA Twitter, boxing Twitter, kickboxing Twitter, um, sports Twitter is talking about it. What was your initial reaction when you saw uh, the news start coming out? Uh, yeah, because this news was announced around 3 a.m. Uh, our time last night, and I was just laying in bed and I saw... Um, a Twitter account, uh, Kaposa, I think it was, mm-hmm. uh, something like that, uh, tweeted about it. Um, basically, what happened was uh, somebody tweeted the picture of Floyd and uh, Tennyson, and I thought basically Floyd was doing a sort of a, a fan meeting thing in, in Japan. It was a fan, and he's taking a picture and things like that with the, the fans. It just somehow someone was joking about it being a fight. Then Kaposa tweeting, I thought, okay, about rising having a press conference, and Floyd was was there, and for uh, maybe Floyd's doing some sort of partnership with Ryzen. Um, sort of thing, you know, maybe promoting it elsewhere or whatever. Um, but when I heard that he was fighting, uh, ten. I've, by the way, I've never heard of Tennyson before. This, right? I'm not exactly big on on that kind of scene. Um, I've never heard this guy before. I, all I know is that he's at what 120 pounds or something like that. Um, and I saw that this fight was announced. Um, and I thought, you know, what the, what the hell was going on here? I didn't actually say what the hell. I said another word. Um, but you know, I'm not going to repeat that word. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's shocking, right? I mean, obviously the rules aren't out there. I saw Helwani tweet saying the rules aren't officially out there, but what you, you and the quarter were talking about is what I agree with. Um, it's going to be an exhibition, isn't it? It's, it's not going to be anything real serious. Um, there's talks of being a four round or, you know, whatnot. Um, but you know, what, what is Tennyson's walk around weight? Do you, do you know what that is? You know, what weight is this going to be at? Is he going to be blown up? You know, is he just going to walk into this fight and, 
I mean, what is what is happening with this? Yeah, really, it's a bit of a shit show, right? Um, well, I mean, of course it is. Um, Tennyson is a is a is a extreme prodigy in terms of kickboxing, in terms of MMA, but that it means relatively little in terms of fighting Floyd Mayweather in a boxing match and an exhibition match. It just doesn't mean the same. Um, you know, just like McGregor is a great MMA fighter, but it doesn't mean you can beat Floyd Mayweather in a boxing match. Um, you know, James Tony, great boxer, doesn't mean he can you know beat Randy Couture in an MMA match. Um, Tension walks around probably tops out maybe one forty, one forty five maybe, uh, and he cuts you know obviously down to like the one twenty two, one twenty five ish range. Um, he fought uh, Kyogor, uh, uh Higuchi or Higuchi, uh, who fought Demetrius Johnson back in the day in the UFC. Um, he fought him in a kickboxing match. It's probably a name you, you might know. But other than that, yeah, I mean, he's somebody that a lot of people are going to have to look up in YouTube. Um, great talent. I mean, in terms of a analogy or an analog, more, more specific, uh, like Inoue or Kose Tanaka in boxing, like he's equal to that in terms of prodigy level for kickboxing. It just doesn't mean the same with, you know, boxing rules. And again, I don't know if you were on, uh, but I'll just repeat it. The rumor is at this point, three minute, uh, three round exhibition fight, boxing rules with MMA gloves. That's the rumor. Basically a shit show. Um, it is, and let's be real. I mean, this is not going to be, you know, Floyd's going to win this and whatever. Um, it's really good for tennis, right? I mean, this promotion is going to be so good for his name. Um, you know, the BBC over here, big, big outlet. Big, big outlet, you know, big TV network. They wrote an article on tennis today on their website. You would never have seen that without this fight. Nobody in the UK, barely anybody, apart from the very few hardcore MMA fans and things like that, the ones who follow Rising, they never heard of this guy. Whereas now he was trending on Twitter because of Floyd Mayweather, Conor McGregor's Instagram about him. You know, at the end of the day, it's so big for tennis because you've got McGregor who has got millions and millions of Instagram followers, 50 cents tweet about it. It doesn't matter if they're trolling. It's promotion for tennis, right? So in that sense, it's great promotion for Ryzen. It's great promotion for tennis, but sadly, it's a shit show. But it's going to do good for, for tennis career because he's only 20, a lot of promotion, millions of people are going to know who he is. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's very good. But other than that, it's a complete shit show. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I think it is amazing for tennis. Like, he... He instantly gets catapulted to another stratosphere in terms of just like star power, like casual sport, like relevance or rareness, um, which is great for him. I mean, he is a guy that's deserving of it in a way because I think he is really extremely talented. And I think in a few years, he's going to really come into MMA and really explode on the scene. Um, and he's already done that sort of in, in kickboxing. He might be the new Israel Adesanya in a way. Um, so. I want to talk about him, by the way, at some point. I, that's good. I, I'm glad. Um, but I, I think he could be like the Japanese version of that in a way. But it's it's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about him fighting Demetrius Johnson in MMA. We're talking about him fighting Floyd Mayweather in boxing. Let's be honest, both fights are equal, equally uh, unlikely to win. Um, this just makes no sense from a managing standpoint, other than it's a huge payday for tennis. It's a huge moment and exposure for him when otherwise he wouldn't get it. And let's be honest, no one's going to fault him for losing the exhibition match. Like, no one cares. Um, if you're Mayweather, it keeps you busy and active and you don't face any sort of risk and you keep that Pacquiao option open for next year. You know, I, I this is prize fighting one-on-one, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, let's be honest. I've said it before. It's the same with Gregor Mayweather. I didn't actually watch that fight live. Um, but we're all gonna watch it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna watch this fight. <laughs> like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be staying up and watching. It. I mean, well, staying up. I mean, it, it's gonna be in Japan, so it's gonna be in the morning in our time. Um, but I'm gonna be watching this fight. Um, because you know, let's be honest. It, it's we all enjoy shit shows. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like we, we watched Mayweather McGregor. We knew who's gonna win that. But we watched it because it's it's different. You know, it's a, it's a spectacle. I'm not saying this is a spectacle, but Mayweather is coming out. Um, of retirement for this complete joke. Um, but we're all going to watch it. And, and everybody knows we're going to watch it. That's why it's being made. 
I mean, I'd like to know how much money Floyd's getting paid for this. I honestly would love to know how much Roy's are paying him for this. Um, because, you know, you look at the money that Floyd's made before. I mean, obviously, it's a no-risk uh, situation for Floyd, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, big rewards, uh, no risk. Uh, you know, it, it's not like Tennyson's going to go in there and land fucking high kicks and that. So, you know, it's good for Floyd in terms of money, but I'd like to know how much he's getting paid for it. Uh, I would probably guess, you know, tens of millions of dollars guaranteed. I mean, if you're Floyd and you're making that flight out to Japan, you're asking for a lot, I, I would say. Also, do Ryzen do pay-per-views? Like, I'm assuming this will be pay-per-view event. It's They do online pay-per-views for the U.S. market. I don't know about the U.K. I'm assuming it's the right. same. I'm assuming it's the same right. in the U.K. Um, um, I mean, I've, I've never kind of uh, watched a live Ryzen event, so I'm not too sure. I've watched one live. Usually I watch them on playback on YouTube because they're in the middle of the night and I have no desire to stay up all night and watch Japanese MMA. I did that when I was a kid growing up. I'm good now. I don't need to do that. Um, so for most people, it's probably going to be around $20, $25 in the U.S. In the U.K., I'm expecting around the same uh, in in, uh, in pounds. And it'll be online. You go to Ryzen.com, buy it through them sort of way. Um, and that is what it is. Um, I think that's probably not where he's planning on getting his money from. I think Floyd's thing guaranteed. Ryzen's probably worried about how they're getting their money. Because uh, I remember, I think it was Luke Thomas said that Ryzen's uh, excuse or reason as to how they can pay for Floyd is from pride. I think you said DVD sales, which is fucking, <laughs> which is fucking hilarious because DVDs haven't been really used in like a decade. So I, lo- I can't remember the last time I bought a DVD, maybe <laughs> about seven years ago. Yo, know, I know. So I, I don't know how this is happening. Um, I, I know you came on late. I went into really Pride's history with the Yakuza and sort of mafia money. And obviously Ryzen is a direct uh, sort of rebirth of Pride. A lot of the execs are still from uh, from Pride over with Ryzen. Uh, one of the main guys from Pride, Saki Gabara, is the main guy at Ryzen. Um, Obviously, that could be a factor, and we just have no knowledge of it. Um, journalism over there isn't really as investigative as we would like it to be, let's be honest. And our side of it, the U.S. side of it, the U.K. side of it, our outlets aren't sending us to Japan to do investigative exposés on the Yakuza. Like, that's just not this, happening. This, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not big on, I mean, uh, I'll watch MMA, but I'll, I'm not, when Pride was around, I was I was young. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't watch Pride. Um uh, and I'm not too sort of big on Rising. I mean, I, I, all I've, not, I've I've watched Gabby Garcia fights in Rising. And hilarious, right? I mean, I've, <laughs> I've watched Gabby Garcia fight. I mean, we're talking about a woman who's 200 pounds fighting a woman who's oh, we have to be my nan. I've seen that fight. I've seen those fights, and it's just a shambles, right? Like, what what is this? Uh, so you know, I've seen that Gabby Garcia has actually got a, a kind of a good sort of um, background. Um, so why she's fighting in these fights, I don't know. But what's the comparisons? I've seen people saying that, you know, Ryzen is a new pride. What's kind of the comparisons between the two? Are they similar? Well, I mean, yes. I mean, com- completely. Like, materially, they are almost the same. They're, like, like is, there any, is there anybody who was involved with pride yes. involved with Ryzen? Yes. Uh, Saki, okay. Saki Ibarra, Um, I forget his first name. I, there's a link in the description of this show, Cameron. Uh, I've said to other people that have been listening. Um, it's a great long piece article, long form article about pride and its sort of nefarious aspects. I know you're going to you're gonna love the article, Cameron. Go check it out. Uh, Jonathan Snowden uh, wrote it. One of the better, I would yeah. say, uh, journalists good in the eye. game. Yeah, uh, I'll check it out. He's a good writer. Great writer. Definitely go check it out. But Saki Ibarra was, I forget his exact position with, with pride. But towards the end, it was him and two other men that were basically in control of pride. Now it is just Saki Ibarra with Ryzen. Um, a lot of maybe the sort of the lower level execs have now been moved up. Um, for those that don't know, Saki Bar basically represented one faction of the Yakuza and the other two execs re- represented two different respective factions in the Yakuza. Now that's sort of gone. That sort of gang war is no longer prevalent. Um, so Ryzen is a direct like uh, descendant of Pride in almost a lot, like almost every way. Um, the people are basically the same people. Um, 
Now, obviously, I would say the product is not the same. Like, the quality of Ryzen isn't the same as Pride. But then again, Pride came around in the 90s where MMA just started. You know, uh, there was a ton of promote promotional companies that were competing at the time, not just the UFC. This was before that monopoly monopolization of the UFC. Nowadays... Ryzen is competing with the the you know the behemoth that is the UFC, that multi billion dollar company. Um, that's why we see more of the Gabby Garcia fights instead of Vanderlei Silva, Quentin Jackson, um, you know Kevin Randall uh, Randleman, you know Fedor Emelianenko. The reason we don't see that quality of names in in Ryzen is because of that factor. Though Tension Nas- Nasakara, he's been fighting kickboxing matches on Pride. And they've been high level kickboxing matches, so I will give credit to that at least. Yeah, I'm gonna go check some of Tennyson's fights out, man. Um, never seen him fight before. I've watched Crow Cop in Rising, by the way. Just add that. And that's probably a, a really good comparison in a way to Tension, because both guys great kickboxing prodigies and talents, and then came over to MMA through Japanese MMA. Uh, obviously, one's a heavyweight and one's 120 pounds. Uh, but similar sort of uh, aspect there, I would say. Didn't Fedor fight one fight in Ryzen? <sighs> he might have. I, um, I think he did. I think Fedor fought in Ryzen when they first started. I think it was after the Maldonado fight. Or it might have been before. I'm not too sure. Or or was it the Maldonado fight? <laughs> I think Maldonado was in the, uh, in Russia, right? So I don't. that wasn't Ryzen. Because, you know, that that was controversial. From I don't know that won that fight, but it was in Russia. Um, but Fedor definitely fought in Rising. Um, somebody in the chat might be able to correct me, but I'm pretty sure. I'm a hundred percent sure he fought in Rising once. No, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. They fought in Rising. I'm looking up his record right now uh, as we speak. Um, yes, he fought. Uh, oh, that's right. It was the uh, the Indian uh, undefeated guy Sin Jadeep. And then he fought Fabio, yeah. and then he fought Maldonado at Fight Nights Global, which is a Russian promotion. And then he had the Bellator run. Um, yeah, thank you for that uh, catch there, Cam. Um, it's just like I, again, for those that maybe have joined late, go back and watch the beginning of the show. Um, go read this article by Jonathan Snowden. Get sort of a more contextualized understanding of Japanese combat sports, and really the backwards way it is just handled. Like this is straight out of the Jake LaMotta era of the mafia in the U.S. boxing scene. And it's the same over there in Japan in all of combat sports. It just is. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll read the excerpt again from that article because I think it's just amazing. Uh, from Jonathan Snowden. Celebrities, freak shows, and pro wrestlers share the stage with the best fighters in the world, and the result was something that could never be duplicated. It was an orgy of excess fueled by mafia money and legal steroids a spectacle that was almost obscene in its grandeur. That is exactly what Japanese combat sports is. Um, Cam, any sort of uh, wrapping up thoughts on this topic before we go to uh, another caller and then obviously run down all the action this weekend? No, man, just bring the caller in. I've said all I need to say about that. Going out to uh, Ron, the mastermind, a.k.a. Fighter IQ from uh, the Boxing Voice. Ron, how you doing? Hey, what's going on, man? How's your day? I'm doing good, man. It's been a, a little bit of a crazy day for me personally, but I'm here on the show. It's always fun. Um, obviously. Hope, it, hope I, everyone's I, all well. Uh, thank you. I, obviously, uh, I asked Cam sort of his like initial first reaction. I want your initial first reaction to this news. Uh, I fucking laughed. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, once, once it came across my um, YouTube, and it's funny, like, I got, the YouTube notification arising before it was all over announced. And so I was like, well, it's a slow day. Let me just put it on. And I, I was in the kitchen. And then sure enough, Floyd Mayweather was up there. And I'm just like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm like, nah, nah, nah. And, this, and then sure enough, it went down to the whole, this dude's really rising. But obviously there's probably some stuff they're going to try to work out, um, things like that. But I've seen that. I've seen Tishin before. He's actually fought uh, an IBF champion uh, boxer. Um, he fought Amnet. And, um, oh, that's right. If you know Kazuto Ioka? Yes. Uh, the three division champ. His only loss is to the guy that this guy beat in kickboxing. So if you build the timeline, Ioka's only loss was to a guy named Amnet, 
when he lost his belt, he made a transition to kickboxing. He's a little bit older, and then he lost to this guy. So that's actually how the first time I actually seen this guy before. Is so it, once he was on the screen, I'm like, oh shit. Okay. It, isn't isn't Amnet the guy that also went back to the Olympics with Hassan Dom when they? Yeah, just, I'm it, not ruined wrong. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've interviewed so him a few times. He's actually beaten this guy. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So I was laughing, like, oh, shit, I know this kid. And, you know, I watched a little bit of kickboxing, too. I watched K1. Um, you know, I like this guy named Takaru. And, you know, I'm like, oh, this is like a, a younger version of that guy. So seeing how this is all working out together, um, I, I think is exciting in a fun way. Like, I, it's not a serious fight. I'm looking at the weight class. I'm like, Floyd is big. If, you, if you're a boxing fan, this is like comparing – like, Donnie Nietzsche is fighting Floyd Mayweather. Like, this is the size difference. Like, these are small guys. So, Floyd's a little bit older. He's making the combat seem kind of fun and awkward. And I think that's what we need every year. I think every year we need something weird and different. I think sometimes things get so serious in the combat sports that we need a little bit of lighthearted, some fun, and, and some crossovers. Because I felt like once Mayweather fought, uh, Conor McGregor, I've seen a surge of MMA fans that I've never heard, you know, before, and vice versa. A lot of MMA fans became more of a boxing fan or started being selective boxing fans. So this is something cool because kickboxing and and, um, and even like the smaller weight classes, the Japanese weight classes, Japanese or Asian boxing scene doesn't really get that much attention. So this is going to be something where a lot of people are going to be very curious, do a little bit of homework, and at that point, I, I think it's just great for that. The, the, the obvious is this is a money spectacle. Um, you know, Floyd has done Conor McGregor. He went into the WWE and fought the big show. Um, history repeats itself. Muhammad Ali, like you, I think you mentioned earlier, I mean, he fought the Japanese wrestler. I mean, things are, you know, meant for entertainment. So I think many people forget that Floyd is a retired fighter. And I know that Floyd is supposed to be, um, you know, one of the best in this generation. So you kind of want to see him compete with the best, but Floyd's a retired man. So this is maybe some just retired foolishness that he wants to do. And I just look at it as like a retired boxer doing retired things with money. You know, I'm going over to Japan. I'm going to go have some fun on the horizon. And I'm going to make a little money over it, you know. He's never competed overseas and never did anything outside of it. Maybe this was something on his bucket list, but it was ne- it never made sense for his boxing career to truly do it. So now since he's retired, like, you get bored. As a, as a fighter – you kind of want to get that itch off in a safe way, you know, without coming back like Sugar Ray Leonard did and kind of, or like Roy Jones fighting too long and, and stuff like that. So for Floyd Mayweather doing this, and this is also like a huge opportunity given this kid, you know, it's, 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 it's a virtually unknown here, but Floyd is always the guy who doesn't necessarily pick like the, the fight we always want. Sometimes it works that way, but he kind of fights the guy that has a big following. So like Ricky Hatton with the UK, you know, he fights a lot of the Hispanic guys, um, the Mexican uh, uh, fighters on the Cinco de Mayo, the Mexican independence, Conor McGregor with the Irish following. So, you know, fighting the Filipino champion, Manny Pacquiao. So it's not surprising. He wants to fight people or have some sort of spectacle with a country. And this country supports this young kid. Um, he's very talented. And maybe this is something that Floyd can end up marketing this guy, you know, in the future. You know, maybe this is something where Floyd kind of, you know, maybe it's not a real fight. And then this kid rides off to become the star and Floyd gets some of that money. He's going to be hanging out in Japan, gets to promote that. Um, Oscar De La Hoya lost to Bernard Hopkins and Sugar Shane Mosley. And sure enough, they were promoted by Oscar De La Hoya. So there's a lot of fun things that happen here. We don't have to take it so serious sometimes, you know. And I know this is a foolish fight, but I, I'm entertained. I'm going to go watch it. I've never seen anything like this, so... Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have some fun with it, you know. Very quickly, uh, well, actually, Ron, any more points on this? Uh, or no, nah, just that's it, you know. All right, and Ron, if you want to come back on after we talk about the fights, uh, feel free to press one to get out of the queue, uh, or hang up, or press one to get back in. Um, quickly, Steven Espinoza by way of Marcos Viegas of uh, Fight Hub uh, TV, um, saying Ryzen has the money to give him Fuji TV. Uh, is back in a big chunk of it. It's a special New Year's Eve programming. Uh, and this is Marcos uh, speaking now, saying Espinosa then continues at a Showtime pay-per-view is not ideal due to the time challenges of the event happening in Japan. So if anyone out there may be worried that this was going to be a $60, $80 pay-per-view on Showtime, it's not going to be that. Don't worry. 
Um, I, I, I was pretty much assured that it wasn't going to happen that way, but at least we get a little bit of a confirmation of that. And look, Fuji TV is a big, um, sort of, uh, power broker of an entity in Japan. I mean, I feel like that should be obvious to some, but obviously not everyone's educated on Japanese, uh, sort of media and, and sort of TV rights. The second Fuji TV backed out of Pride is when Pride got bought up by the UFC. It was literally in the span of maybe a month or two. When In terms of business world, that's a very quick window from losing your TV rights partner to then getting bought out. Um, so if Fuji TV is completely supporting this and putting up the money, which they do have the money for, um, I can see that obviously being a factor as well. Um Cam, obviously, I think it's time to just go over to the fights that happened this weekend because there was some really good fights. Um, but since there was a little bit of an eclectic sense of the weekend in terms of news, obviously with this Mayweather news and just the fights overall, where do you want to start? Uh, I mean, I, I'll kind of watch the uh, I'll watch the MMA card. Um, I watch the UFC. Uh, still, I watched the Birch Help fight. Uh, I didn't really pay much attention to the boxing at the weekend. I know there wasn't much on. Um, whoa, I did, whoa, uh, whoa. You're not supporting your countryman, Josh Taylor, Ryan Burnett? Come oh, on. Oh, yeah, I, I watch, I, of course I watched that one. Um, <laughs> just kind of flung over my head a bit. But, yeah, man, I watched that card. But, yeah, we can, talk, we can start with that. You want to start with the Burnett-Taylor uh, doubleheader? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, we did a show on this on Saturday. I think you were on for that one as well, or you called in for a bit at least. I think you were. Right, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Not much has changed in my opinions. I mean, Ryan Burnett, I felt like, was winning that Donaire fight, even though Donaire looked highly uh, competitive in it. Um, that right hand, which I called out on the previous show as being a an open shot for Donaire, proved to be open. Donaire obviously has that defensive hole in his guard for a straight right hand to land at will. And then if you land that straight hand, the left hook can follow that quite easily. Um, however, the injury uh, for Burnett, which I think we still don't really have any information on, unfortunately, um, obviously stopped the fight. I, it has that asterisk attached to it. Um, I really hope Burnett comes back healthy. I've heard that this may be a reoccurring injury. I'm worried about that uh, for such a young athlete. Uh, but Burnett's, in my opinion, still the goods. I still think Burnett's a top five guy in the division, and this was just a freak injury, and that happens sometimes in the sport. Um and also equally true, I think Donaire looked good, and I think a Donaire Tete fight is a lot is a is a fun fight now, especially with Tete looking poor in his last uh, showing. Donaire looking pretty good, even though I thought he was losing. I think that fight is probably going to equal a very fun, entertaining fight, unless it ends up being a lot of clinching, a lot of tie ups, like the last Tete fight, because I see Tete being open to that right hand left hook combo from Donaire, just like Burnett was. Um, I don't see Tete really being able to guard that. So seeing Tete really sort of get tested in that way by a guy like Donaire, I cannot wait to see. And on top of that, obviously, Josh Taylor, Ryan Martin, not much to say about that fight. Josh Taylor, utterly dominant. Uh, his footwork angles, his feints, all sublime, all just 10 out of 10, perfect. Um, I mean, obviously, the pro-grace fight, looking ahead, it seemingly is going to be a fantastic fight I cannot wait for. Obviously, the Branchick fight is there. I know... You can think the branch fight is more competitive than I do. I think Taylor is just too too skilled. The levels are there. I, I don't see branch being able to really catch up to Taylor's footwork and it, be able to land that combination. Um, you know, turned out to be a night for the World Boxing Super Series that looked like it was going to be really fun and then had a freak injury. And then we had a very dominant one sided fight, kind of a lackluster, anticlimactic affair for uh, the World Boxing Super Series. Cam, your thoughts? Yeah, I echo what you said, especially with Donair. I feel like the Donair Tete fight, um, I, I tweeted actually after the fight, uh, straight after the fight, I said I think that the Donair Tete fight is a lot more competitive than um, people make out. Um, I, I had Tete as the favourite this tournament going into the tournament. I do not have that now. Uh, I thought he looked very poor in his first fight. Um, he looked poor in the fight before that. I thought, you know, he stunk to join out against Navez. Um mm-hmm. But in the fight before that, he starched a, a South African out with the first punch he landed. So he's so hot and cold today. Like he, he's just there's no in between. He'll he'll have a spectacular knockout performance, or he'll have a very lackluster twelve round decision, which is just you know horrible to watch. And it's 
you know, scrappy and people, you know, clinching and things. Uh, for me, I think Donair, he can catch Tay and he can knock him out. Uh, I think you know, it's fair to say Donair's got a power. I thought he looked very fast. Um, I thought he looked fresh. Uh, fair enough, it was only four rounds. Like I said on the show, uh, straight after the fight, I thought Donair looked good. I thought, you know, he looked sharp. Um, he was pushing Bennett back and he was landing his shots and his shots looked powerful. He looked crisp. You could hear the shots. So I feel like Donaire's got a very good chance against Teddy. Um, it's an exciting fight, uh, a fight that I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, same as with the Inoue Rodriguez fight. I think those two fights there alone are very good. Uh, Josh Taylor, I was on the show, I thought Ryan Martin was very poor. I actually watched an interview with Abel Sanchez yesterday, uh, heading into that fight. He spoke about how Ryan Martin's going to you know, be very fast, you know, uh, throw a lot of punches, and we're going to see something that we've never seen before. Well, that definitely did not happen. In, in that fight um, so you know I was disappointed with Ryan Martin um, I feel like he, he showed up you know I thought from the way he was fighting I thought you know it looked like maybe the occasion got to him um, not saying that is the case but the way he was fighting it looked like that you know he wasn't doing anything of note uh, Josh Taylor really just has to do what he had to do and he got him out of there but I think Taylor Branchick I favour Taylor heavily I think Branchick will give it a go Um I've seen a few people on Twitter say they think Branchick will, will give him problems. But I've also seen a lot of people say, like you who said that they don't think Branchick will give him problems. So I think it's kind of a um, a fight where, because Branchick just seems to be quite an, uh, an aggressive style and he seems to be tough and that. I think, you know, that kind of style makes a lot of people think he'll be tough for Taylor. Uh, but I think technically Taylor's a lot more, well, technically a lot better than Branchick. You know, that's, that's fair to say. He's a lot more athletic. Um technically much more uh, fundamental. So, I think Donair Tete is a very good fight. I think Taylor's a clear favourite against Baranchik, but I think the whole, you look at kind of the, the semi-finals of both these tournaments now, they're very good. Um, they're very open and there's no clear winner. Um, you look at Inoue and probably, potentially Tete in Donair in that final, then you've got Taylor Progre. You know, there's there's two excellent, excellent fights there. So, I think the World Boxing Super Series this year is livening up pretty well now. Yeah, obviously the Cruiserweight uh, tournament I think is uh, either has started already. Or I know the Breedis fight is uh, this weekend. That's sort of limping around, I feel like, as like the, the third wheel of the group um, with Usyk and, and uh, Gassiev just not being in. I feel like it lost a lot of luster. Um, but you're right that this the, the Bantamweight tournament, the Junior Welterweight tournament, it's turning out to be a lot of fun uh, and much more competitive than I thought. Even uh, the quarterfinal fights um, uh, with Raylick, uh, Trinovsky, that turned out to be much more competitive than I thought going into it. Um, I th- we thought Tete was going to blow out his his opponent, Mikhail Elion. That just did not happen. A lot of things are turning out ways that we just did not expect it to be. Uh, and obviously, these semifinal matchups, I think, all across the board seem to be fun, entertaining fights. And then I think the perceived finals of both or at least the consensus uh, finals for both, both seem like fun uh, matchups that may determine uh, a next sort of pound-for-pound pound extreme talent, obviously in a new way. And maybe obviously the winner of Progress Taylor, I think really sort of uh, supplant, uh, uh, sort of conquers the division in a way without fighting Ramirez, without fighting Hooker Sacedo winner. The winner of Progress Taylor, I think, in a lot of people's minds would be the guy and thought of as a, an extreme talent in the sport. Um, so we're moving away from that, unless you have any final thoughts about uh, the Washington Super Series. Yeah, I, I just want to add, um, with the Inoue situation, if he wins this tournament, can anybody... Because re- I see a lot of people, I wrote a tweet about it, I said that people seem to think that Inoue is still untested. I get it, you know, we had a caller in the other day who said the same. But if Inoue wins this tournament... Surely there cannot be anybody out there that, that can doubt him as a no. legit pound for pound fighter. They, you just can't, right? I mean, if he gets through this tournament, what else does he have to do? Like, that's just wrong. Uh, my say. my only concern, and it's just a slight concern, because um, I know how there is that very vocal minority in the boxing fandom that just hates everything. Like they just n- nothing satisfies them, right? If NOA goes out there, let's say he obliterates Rodriguez like Peano style, like it's just not easy. I mean, it's just it's just completely easy. Like there's no competition at all. And then he, let's say Donaire gets past Tete and he beats Donaire. There, there's going to be excuses, I think, from a very vocal minority. And again, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to emphasize minority. 
there. Um, the consensus will be that NOA is a great. I think the consensus already is that. Um, I think there's. Oh my, I, I, th- I think so anyway. You know, I, I think I think the majority of us boxing fans realize how talented NOA is. At least us hardcores, people that are in the circle in a way, the people that are in the community, we know that NOA is a, an extreme talent, a three division champ that's beaten a ton of guys who is in his what fourth professional fight beat Rahuchi Taguchi, who went on to be a unified champion. Like, that doesn't happen for the average champion, like the average elite top 10 pound-for-pound talent. In no way, is in a separate class from them. He really also, is. If you, if you add, who else in this t- bantamweight tournament would have blown out Payana with the first punch that landed? No Nobody. One. No one. No one would have done that. No one would have done it. Payana would have, looked, would have made everyone look human. Like, Payana could have beat some of these guys. Let's not get it twisted here. Peano could have beat a Burnett, Tete, Donaire. Like, Peano is that good. He is that gritty. I've seen him spar guys like Ringendow in the gym. Uh, Peano is an extremely talented guy. Um, his only loss is to Rashi Warren, and he beat Rashi Warren in the fight before that. So. Was that a spit decision that round as well, right? Yes, yes, it was. It was a very close fight. Very close fight. Um, no one does that to Peano, ever. Like, uh, Inoue's power is truly otherworldly. It just is. Yeah, and I agree. And also, another thing to add, I think, I think, I've seen a lot of people say they think Rodriguez would actually give Inoue some some new problems. And what I feel like, if if Inoue goes in there and destroys Rodriguez, I think a lot of people are going to come out and say, "Well, well Rodriguez hasn't beat anybody, and no, you know, he only beat Paul Butler. That's how we know. You know, what I mean, there's, there's going to be excuses either way. And if mm-hmm. if Teddy beats Don there and you know, if he beats Donair and, he, and in a way blows Teddy out, you know, Teddy's going to be, well, you know, we've, we've seen him look last, last luster. He's never proven to be elite. And then Donair will be shot. So I think that's the situation that Inoue will be in with some of these critics. But in my opinion, I don't understand why these people who just shit on everything in boxing, nothing impressed them. Why do you follow the sport? You know, we don't need people like that in boxing. If nothing satisfies you, you shouldn't be in the sport. It's as simple as that. I, I, I agree. Um, and again, I mean... I think there's obviously there's some substance to the debate of hey I mean because look at me like I'm obviously saying that anyway is like an, an, a talent above the top ten pound for pound like I think he's that talented. Um, people should I think have a substantive debate about that like I, I'm okay with that like let's say I'm okay people are saying hey let's push the brakes down a little bit. Anyway is obviously a top talent but he's not better than X Y Z and go down the list. I, I'm okay with that debate. But uh, like like you sort of alluded to, we had a caller the other day say that he's unproven. That's just not true. Like, that's categorically untrue. And unfortunately, like you said, when if people think anyway is unproven and untested, then they, they're going to think the same about Rodriguez, Tete. You know, they're going to make excuses about Donair. You know, they're going to say the same about Burnett. They're gonna they're gonna say these excuses, you know. It's if a new if if a new way is unproven, so is Tete and Rodriguez. Exactly. That, that's yeah. You know I mean, so he's not gonna get any credit for beating them. Yes. Um. And and, and if he beats Donet, Donet's gonna be over the hill, and he's been beat like five times in the past four years. You know, what I mean, it's gonna be things like that. Honestly, Cam, for the people that are saying in a ways untested, don't get on the bandwagon after he wins the tournament. We don't want you, okay? Because yeah. because you then just be show that you're a hypocrite. Because if you if your entire fundamental argument about Inoue is that he's unproven, then that discredits the entire tournament, like you've said, like I've said. So I don't want those fans jumping on the bandwagon. We, the, the the bandwagon is so much better than you people. So don't join. We're good without you. I think most of the time, I mean, when, when you talk about the guys who say Inoue is untested, they've not even watched the, the, the guys he's beat. They've not seen him beat, knock Narvaez out after moving up two divisions. They've not seen him beat Taguchi. They've not seen Inoue fight these guys, I guarantee it. And, I mean, there's just such a lack of knowledge on the lower weight classes. We know that. And even on our end, like, it takes effort from people within the U.S. media or U.K. media to really stay up to date on the lower weight classes, you know, 108 pounds up. It's hard. It's oh, not you, have e- find, you have to find streams. It's annoying. It's man. not easy. Like, I completely understand why it's a niche within a niche. I completely understand that. But also, if you're not knowledgeable about something, don't speak as if you are. Admit your ignorance. Because that's okay. It's okay to be ignorant. You know, like I, there's plenty of topics we will discuss on this show that I do not have proper knowledge on. And I will throw my hands up in the air and say, you know what? I just do not have enough knowledge for this subject. Maybe somebody else can talk about it or go to this person. I know this person is an expert. I know this media member is really in tune with this beat. Go to that person. 
you know. So, you know, know your lane, people. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, but moving off of the, the, the bitching about fans, because we can do that probably all day, let's be <laughs> honest. Um, I, I sort of missed what you said about the Miguel Burchelt, uh, Mickey Ramon. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't watch this fight yet. You did not watch it? I haven't watched this fight, no. All right. Yet. All I would say about it uh, then is it's a great fight. Go watch it if you haven't yet, people, because I know a lot of people just did not see it. Uh, ESPN Plus being a factor, and plus it being on the same time as college football, the UFC, a lot of people just skipped it. Um, this was maybe not top 10 fight of the year. Top 20, though, definitely. Uh, these two guys went at it for seven, eight rounds. Uh, sorry, nine rounds. Um, and Burchell, for I would say probably the first time in his career, really looked like he can get sucked into a brawl, into a fight that's not uh, at, to, his, to his advantage. Uh, we've seen him really utilize his skills, his technique, his brutality in a really fine-tuned, balanced way. And this was the first fight I've seen him really not do that, really get sucked into a fight he shouldn't be fighting. Uh, credit to Mickey Roman for it, being able to uh, sort of draw that out of uh, Miguel Pichelt. But again, Pichelt, just such a devastating hitter. The way he puts his combinations together, he's a nightmare for everyone at 130 pounds, if not the best guy at 130 pounds. Give me Burchelt versus Machado. Uh, I want that now. Uh, other than that, this card was not that great, uh, I'll be honest. And on top of that, I still have not seen the Solomon Barrera, uh, Sean Monaghan fight. I completely forgot that fight was on. Yeah, I, I, I'll i be honest. I was I was getting ready for the show, right? Getting all my top. Who top-up. won that fight? Uh, Solomon Barrera won by unanimous decision. Won like every round. Right. I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, I was expected. But... Um. I'll be honest, when I was getting ready for the show today, uh, I completely forgot about it. And then it was obviously in the box rec schedule. So I was like, oh, yeah, shit. Probably should at least mention that. So I haven't seen it yet, folks. But Sam Barrera, he's a nice guy. I've interviewed him a couple times. I've been in camp with him. He's a very nice guy. Go watch it. Support it on YouTube, at least. Because uh, Facebook is a piece of shit. Anyways, <laughs> uh, digressing to uh, the UFC card, which I think, obviously, in terms of Fight cards was the dominant card of the weekend in combat sports. Uh, Daniel Cormier defeating Derek Lewis uh, via second round submission. Utterly dominant. It was just a stay busy fight on short notice. Not really much to talk about in the main event. Other than, obviously, Daniel Cormier is now the true Popeyes super champion, as they say. Yeah, and also the first guy to defend two belts successfully, right? So... Mm -hmm. That's another thing he's got on his belt. I mean, there's no doubt that Cormier's one of the greatest fighters of all time. Um, he's only lost to John Jones, right? So, um, I mean, let's be fair. We all expected Cormier to win this fight mm-hmm. uh, without really... Cormier, um, Lewis's only hope was to land a big shot. Um, other than that, he had no hope. He had no hope anyway. You know, when you're looking back, you know, I kind of watched the fight back again today. It's just bad levels, man. And Cormier's just on a little different level to a lot of these guys, uh, if not all the guys. A lot of heavyweight, apart from Jones. and You know, Gus gave him a tough fight, but a heavyweight as well. You know, how many of these guys can beat Cormier? You know what I mean? It's hard to see. Um, so, you know, I, I'm kind of making the most of Cormier now because he's going to be out of sport soon. And I think he's going to be a guy that's going to be... I think a lot of these guys, you know, they've been hating on Cormier. I think a lot of these people, a lot of these fans are going to wish they appreciate Cormier more when he does eventually retire. Um, because he's just a, you know, a, a genuine guy, uh, one of the all-time greats, you know, at heavyweight and light heavyweight. I mean, how many times have we seen a fighter in MMA that's been a great at two weight divisions? I mean, off the top of my head, how many can you think of? Because I can't think of any at all. But this is this guy is one of them. So I think uh, Cormier is going to be one of those guys that we look back on and just, you know, we just kind of appreciate him a lot more. Than what we have done whilst he's been fighting. I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think even right now we've seen that transition to him really getting, uh, getting appreciated. Obviously, with the John Jones second PD test failure uh, or positive test versus a and his suspension, I think the public has sort of turned in, in favor of DC because he's just been the consistent rock to that division. And like you said, he is one of the best fighters of all time. He's only lost to John Jones, who arguably is the best fighter of all time if you can ignore the whole steroid scandals. Um, you know, I, it it's one of those situations where he is such a good guy. Like I, I, I think everyone should go back and watch. For those that are just recent, uh, I think it was the Eric Hawani show uh, last week before the fight. Daniel Cormier was on, and he started talking about more of his personal life. And for those who don't know Daniel Cormier's personal life, it's a real tragic one. Um, 
you know, his father uh, being killed at an early age, um, his firstborn child dying uh, in a car accident. You know, these are all things that really affected him. And go back and check out that interview with Erhawani last week if you haven't yet, people. It's one of the, like, rawest and just emotional interviews I've seen in a while uh, from a fighter. And if you can't come away from that and like DC and go, man, I just want him to be happy and successful. Like, he's everyone's favorite uncle in a way. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 like, honestly, DC is just a great guy. I met him once very briefly fantastic person um you know this fight is what it is you know but i think in a longer sort of a long-term sense appreciate dc while he's here because he's gone very quickly um it I mean, is who's gonna be who's, who's gonna be that last fight is it gonna be jones you call me i mean lesnar which one do you think it's gonna be i think he fights lesnar next but i also think he fights john jones next i know he's talked about it he went on i think it was today uh, he, did. Show. he said that he doesn't need he is a point where he doesn't need that fight anymore that's and, what he said and, and look he explained it i think amazingly well about how in terms of the mental space he had to get to to sort of accept that john jones wasn't going to be here um you know him thinking that the suspension was going to be much longer and us we all thought the suspension was going to be longer him thinking that he was going to retire before john jones get off the suspension and him getting to that mental space of just john not being there john not being around um I get it. Like, I totally understand the thought process behind it, the mental space he's in. But I also know that it's Daniel Cormier, who is a supreme competitive athlete. A guy that, you know, struggled his way to the Olympics only to not go because of kidney failure. This guy, I think, on his dying deathbed, will obviously go, I, I can beat John Jones. I can. I know I can. And for him to leave without getting that third shot when it's obviously available to him, let's not act like John Jones won't take it. Let's not act like Dan, uh, Dana White and WME and the UFC won't push for it because it makes a lot of money. I, I think Daniel looks at it again after Brock Lesnar, after all the money, and goes, I, I need to try one more time. I don't think he wins it, unfortunately. I think John Jones is maybe that kryptonite to DC. Um, you know, John Jones may be the best fighter of all time, and DC just may be the second best fighter of all time. And that happens. Um, but yeah, salute to Daniel Cormier. Like, I know that was a big rant about a lot of nothing, but salute to Daniel Cormier, one of the greats. I will add, um, obviously, I don't want to go off the, this this card, but I did watch, uh, we'll, maybe we'll talk about after this, but I did watch the, uh, I think it's why I was late to the show, I did watch the Jones Gus press conference the other day. Mm. I thought it was very interesting. Well, oh, since we're sort of on the John Jones DC thing, let's touch on that then. Um, what were your thoughts about it? Because I watched it too. I thought I was kind of interested about some of it. Um, I thought it was interesting, man. I thought Gus, I, I kind of liked the way Gus went about things. Um, the fact that he was very vocal. Um, he jumped straight in there and he spoke about um, how, you know, that he, he thought he beat Jones. And when Jones said, um, what was his, his excuse for losing? He said he didn't lose the fight. I, I like that. Um, but I also thought Jones did put him in, kind of did back him up a bit by when he said, um, you know, if you beat me, did you, you know, what was your excuse for losing to Cormier? And he said, he kind of said that he, you know, he didn't answer that. He didn't say whether he thought he lost to Cormier, but he said he beat Jones. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I thought he backed him up. But I thought that, I liked the way that Jones kind of um, pushed Gus, actually. I, I was quite interested. In, I'm a big fan of this fight. I'm, I really am a big fan of this fight. And I'll, I'll get invested in anything they do. Um, because the first fight was so good. And let's be fair. I mean, it's going to be something very special for him to top the, the, you know, the first fight. But I just think these two gel. You know, I mean, there's this kind of chemistry between those two guys. It's weird, um, and I just, I just liked him, and I liked the way they were interacting. I liked the press conference, um, and I liked the fact that Jones pushed him. I think, you know, Jones has said it himself. He's kind of seen what's going on in in the sport now, and he knows this is what sells. And he, you know, that's what he did. He said he wanted to get the fans rifled up, something to talk about, and I liked that. Um, I'm just happy to see Jones back, man. I'm, I'm sounding like a hypocrite because I've always said that I think if you get caught for PDs, you should be suspended, right? For gone. But I'm so happy to see Jones back, man. <laughs> I'm happy to see Jones back. It's just, I'm such a big fan of the guy. Um, I think a lot of the stuff he says it is a load of crap. But, you know, he is one of the greatest fighters of all time. I'm happy to see him back, man. I'm a big fan of this fight. I, I, do you know what? It's one of those fights where I don't mind who wins. Because um, I like Gus so much, I'd love to see him become champion. Um, 
whether or, I don't think he can beat Jones. I think, you know, I think what Jones said before that he didn't train properly is, you know, does play a part. I think Jones will, will do a pretty dominant uh, performance in this one. Um, I just, you know, I think Gus is, for me, is just good, but just not good enough, if you know what I mean. So, but I'm interested in this fight. Oh, I like it. And plus, I'd just add to that very quickly. I would argue that we've seen sort of, we've seen the best days of Gus years ago. Like Gus, has, yeah. Gus yeah. hasn't looked the same in quite some time. But on top of that, uh, sort of like the broader sense of the press conference, absolutely echo what you said about uh, like Gus Van, you know, like talking. Definitely had a chip on his shoulder. I like that. I like that Gus Van wanted to get petty and wanted to talk that shit. Uh, we don't see that much from Gus Van F at all, and it really is only about John Jones. So I like that. And then sort of switching to what you said about uh, John Jones asking about, uh, you know, what he thought about when he lost to DC. Well, how that inter- how that interaction happens that uh, Gus Van was asked a question, and then I think like Dana White or somebody was going to go to the next reporter, and then John Jones stopped the press conference and said, "No, I want to ask a question to to Alexander Gus Van." What and he asked the question about like, "What do you like? Did you think you lost to uh, Daniel Cormier?" And Gus Van. For all the shit talking he planned, because you can tell he planned some of it, for all the pettiness he had, he had not planned for that. And that was just a very interesting sort of um, uh, instance between the two. Uh, again, I like John Jones as a, like, it's going to sound weird, but like as a person, like, I think he's entertaining in a way. Um, he's yeah. weird, man. Like, he doesn't trash talk. He's got this weird way of, of, backing opponents into a corner when it comes to like verbal exchanges like he, he's got this very relaxed calm sort of cold demeanor about him it's just weird how he does it i enjoy watching him doing it well he's sort of like a sociopath like he's sort of like one of those guys that in, yeah. in another life like a thousand years ago he's a warlord of like a clan you know nowadays you know maybe like 1980s he was the head of like wall street he's one of those sociopaths and uh but he also has a great way of being like, um, you know, he can laugh at himself. He has a great way of doing that. I forget how it, it actually happened, but he was asked a question like, what have you learned from the suspension? And somebody in the crowd chanted, nothing. And John Jones just started dying <laughs> from laughter. And that it was, was like, oh, but it's anyway, no more dick pills. He's like, no more dick pills. Yep, <laughs> yep. You know, like John Jones has a very good way of both seeming like a sociopath and like you can connect with him as a person. It's a weird. He's a very weird guy. Like he's Yo, so the complex. Be, the, best, the best one about Jones was when he did that press conference sort of call me rematch, and he was like, "I beat you after a weekend of cocaine." That was the <laughs> yes. best line ever. That was like John Jones is just something else, and obviously he is so different from the come up because you know if anyone that came up around the sport, you know, in the the mid two thousands to like two thousand eleven, when John Jones went from prospect to champion. He was Mr. Christian boy. Like, he was, you know, pastor's kid. You know, he was Mr. Nice Guy. And now to see him talk about dick pills uh, and laugh at himself for getting suspended for steroids, like, it's just such a 180 in the span of a decade that it's it's hard to sort of fathom as a fan that's seen it all. Um, but like you said, I'll echo it. I'm glad he's back. Um, I'm, like, just, I'm just thinking about thinking back to when he was on the Rogan podcast, and oh, <laughs> Rogan was like, "Why do you need dick pills?" And, and Jones goes, "We got a huge cock, Joe." <laughs> Jones has just got his personality. It just he comes out with these weird things he just don't expect. Yeah. I love Jones, man. I, and I, like I've said, I know you probably echo like John Jones. If you can really ignore the PD scandal, he is the best MMA fighter we've ever seen. Oh, I think so. Like he oh, just so. he just is his run from. 2009-ish, 2010-ish, all the way to like 2015 was one of the most insane runs across all of combat sports. Like You could really make that argument. Um, but sort of digressing from that, I, I like the interview. I'm glad John is back. I'm hyped for that card because on top of that, you have Chris Cyborg versus Amanda Nunez. God, that might be the best female fight of all time in combat sports. Who do you think wins that fight? Do you think Nunez has a chance? See, see here's the thing, right? So before that press conference, I'm a big Amanda Nunez fan. Like I've always been high on her from way back in the day, uh, before before she sort of became champion and had the, the glow up. Um, I've always been a fan. And when I saw them face off, and Chris Cyborg is so much taller, I'm like, holy shit, Amanda has zero chance. But then I saw that Chris Cyborg was in heels, 
and Amanda wasn't. So I need to see them really side by side. I need a size comparison because if Cyborg is significantly bigger than her, I think Amanda's skills and technique, her way of judging distance, won't really matter. You know, I will say one thing. Um, when she, I was obviously watching the stream on the UFC stream, mm-hmm. and uh, let's just say that the chat on the UFC video wasn't very pleasant when Cyborg came out wearing that dress. I will say that. Yo, oh man, MMA fans are the worst. MMA fans are the worst. And shout out to Amanda Nunez though, dressing up like a Brooklyn like uh, rapper from the 1990s. The beanie she dressed on. Like a real tom. I mean, <laughs> real tomboy. Um, I mean, she dresses like a lesbian. Let's be honest. No, not not being disrespectful, but she does dress like one. She embraces that lesbian style. Yeah, I mean, her and her. her I don't know if they're married yet. Uh, but I know they're together. Is it Nina Asinoff? Um, yeah. Yeah, they're they're one of the best like couples in MMA. They they are so friendly. I met them once. I mean, they are super friendly. Um, just great people overall. Uh, but anyway, sort of digressing from that. Uh, press conference, thought it was fun. Can't wait for that card. Back to UFC 230, co-main event. Uh, Ronaldo, Jacare Souza defeating Chris Weidman via KO punch in the third round after Weidman was winning for two rounds. Truly heartbreaking if you're a Chris Weidman fan. Uh, if you're a Jacare fan like myself, man, you must be happy. Get out the air horns. I'm sorry. You might finally uh, see Jack Ray in a title <laughs> shot, man. Just I, shit on Wyman even more. <laughs> I, I love Wyman. Wyman's another guy I met who was extremely friendly, you know, gave me all, all the time in the world. But Jack Ray has been a hardcore darling for like a decade plus, man. Back when he had an afro back in the day, man. People have been been high on Jack Ray. He's one of the greatest uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners to come into MMA. He's a guy that has his arm broken against, ooh, who was it? I don't think it was Marcelo Garcia. It was somebody of that caliber in Abu Dhabi and ended up still submitting that person with a broken arm. God, Ronaldo's just such a badass. Salute to him. Uh, also, man, give him a, surely he has to get the next title shot now after that. Oh, he, I mean, he has to. He has to, right? But, yeah. um, well, it's about time we got a title shot, man. He's beat Weidman, who was going to be the backup if he won this fight. It's got to be Jack Ray's time after this. Absolutely agree. Um, and obviously, we're going to get to the Israel Adesanya uh, sort of fight and where he goes next. But I think, realistically, you throw Jack Ray in there with the winner of uh, Robert Whitaker, Kelvin Gastelum. It makes the most sense in the world. It's a fresh matchup. I love it. And plus, you give a, a true legend in the sport like Jack Ray his just due and give him that title shot in the UFC, which has always been evading him. Um, well, Jack, Jack Ray's lost to both these guys. Yes. I mean, the Kelvin Gastelum fight, obviously... I would say is controversial. Um, I need to go back and watch it, but I remember there's a lot of people thinking that Jack Ray won that fight. Whitaker, though, obviously won his. I mean, I, he, destroyed, he, him. I, d- destroyed him. Destroyed um, him. But I would still like to see that. I think uh, Whitaker maybe not hasn't hasn't slipped in a way, but he's taking some punishment. Um, yeah, those Romero fights were wars, man. I, I, I thought he lost the, the rematch. Judge yeah, I, I did too. So I, I'm curious how Whitaker looks in the Kelvin Gaslin fight in terms of just from damage. You know, we've seen guys like Rory McDonald go through one really hellacious fight and just never the same. Um, curious how Whitaker looks. Because obviously Jacare, even though he is a 39-year-old, slower down version of himself, he's still there. Like, he still has the chin, still has the durability, still has the knockout punch. Still has the grappling there. I want to see that. Um, now in this match, what, 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 what about Weidman? Where's Weidman go now? Because he's lost to. I mean, he's lost to Romero, Rockhold, Musasi, who's obviously not in that, and now he's lost to Jacare. So he's lost to all the top guys. I mean, where does he go now? I mean, Weidman's. I mean, he's, he's well. I mean, what has happened to Weidman, man? I mean, where does he go? I mean, he's lost. I mean, they're talking about impotential I mean, minutes, like heavyweight. I mean, fair enough that division is lackluster, but where is his career going now? He's another guy, unfortunately, that he just had a couple losses by KO or like a, a, like a war with Machida and just was never the same. On top of that, to more answer your question directly, I think Weidman's best hope is to go to 205. Stop weight draining yourself so much. Maybe that helps with the chin issues a little bit. Same with Luke Rockhold. I think Luke Rockhold's chin issues are not directly related to his extreme weight cut, but it's at least partly due to his extreme weight cut. Um... I want to see both those guys move up to 205. I think it would just be healthy for them. Then they're going to extend their careers at that division as well. And plus, let's be honest, 205 is not the murderer's row that is uh, middleweight right now, which I can't believe I'm saying in 2018.
but that's just true. Ten years ago, I would have laughed at that. But now it's just fa- fact. Like middleweight is a very deep top ten division with a lot of talented guys. Weidman is no longer in that picture really. Um, and plus, he's been really obliterated by some of these top guys like Romero. That knockout permanently disfigured his face. Let's not let's not forget that man. Uh, Weidman's uh, eye socket has never been the same since that flying knee knockout loss. Um, if it if he doesn't go yeah, to a fi- if he doesn't go to a five, I I would say retirement. Honestly, like Weidman's one of those guys he can get an executive job at the UFC because he's smart enough. I think he has some sort of business degree as well. Uh, he's obviously was a huge reason and spokesperson in uh, the expansion into the New York market for the UFC. Uh, I think he can do a lot of good things outside the cage uh, as well. Yeah, what well, that uh, that Romero flying knee was one that, like when that landed, I was like I literally winced at that. Like that was horrible, man. The way that the way this Weidman fell into that knee as well, like, it was just horrific. Uh, one of the most brutal KOs I've seen, man. I mean, could you imagine Romero? Uh, I mean, that guy's just a killer. Um, but Weidman for me, I mean, I, I feel for the guy because he's fought twice in Madison Square Garden and got not talent. Just, I mean, Weidman, it's not like he's been. Fair enough, he's been demolished, but he's, I mean, he was, he was, you know, a, a lot of these knockouts he's let out, he's, he's been winning these fights before. Um, you know, so it, he's still like there, but yes, yeah, man. Well, but think, think about this fight. This fight's a great example of it. His boxing hasn't looked that good probably ever. Like his jab was on point, yeah. and it was just that slip right hand counter that Jack Ray threw, and it caught Wyman. And we've always known Wyman, I think, to be a little bit chinny. Like, that's always been a factor. And I think it's due to that weight cut, man. I, I These guys are massive. Wyman and Luke Rockhold, especially, are two gigantic guys. Um, I think when they fought each other, it was very indicative of the fact that they cut way too much weight and they don't have the cardio for middleweight. They just don't. Um, do the rematch. Do the rematch at 205. Yeah, I, honestly, like... I. You put the rematch at 185, I'm really not interested in, in Rockhold Wyman, too. I'm just not. 205, I think it's a different ball game completely. That's 20 extra pounds of not cutting weight. Like, that that will change fighters. It will. Yeah. Uh, you ready to move on to the Israel Adesanya fight, which I know, I think it's just... In terms of hype, I mean, Israel Adesanya is taking over MMA, right? Yeah, what a year, man. Um, obviously, I mean, breakout, fighter of the year, contender at least, uh, knocking out Derek Brunson in one round with nine seconds left to spare in that first round, um, defended every takedown, I mean, dominated every strike he landed, hurt Brunson and landed. This was a star-making performance for Israel Adesanya. I don't know what the pay-per-view buy rate was. I don't know how many eyeballs were on it. But in terms of beating the right guy the right way, showing off the right charisma in the cage and outside of it, I mean, excuse me, he checked off every, every aspect we needed to start making performance. And on top of that, you know, you, you, you watch any of his interviews today on Air Hawani's show or the MMA Hour, the guy is just entertaining. Like, he is just, I don't see any, anything else but stardom and success for this guy. Obviously, the Romero's of the world, uh, maybe the Jackeray's of the world, Maybe the Paolo Bocchino, uh Costa uh, of the world. Maybe those guys give him issues. But other than that, I don't think anyone gives him trouble in this division, and especially Robert Whitaker. I don't think in terms of a stylistic, ma- stylistic matchup that that is a competitive fight. I think Adesani destroys Robert Whitaker when he may not destroy other guys. Do you feel like Whitaker's uh, title runs on a, on a time bomb? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it really is, and I think so. I don't see him. I mean, I'll be if he beats Gaslam, I can see him win that fight. But I don't know, man. He's beat Jacare before, but I mean, yeah. I mean, this guy took a lot of punishment in those ten rounds with Romero. So, well, think about this. I mean, just Whitaker period as a champion was kind of a shocking like occurrence. And like in terms of history and talking about Whitaker's career, like he went from being knocked out from Stephen Thompson at welterweight, moving up, and really going on a run. Like to his credit, but I still think these really great middleweight, especially these young guys are moving up like Pohochina and Israel Asanye. Stylistically, I don't see how Whitaker deals with them. I just don't. I, th- I think Whitaker can deal with these these older guys, maybe like a Jack Array, obviously, uh, Romero to some extent, obviously, because of the age factor and the sort of the athleticism factor. But 
these young guys are are coming at Whitaker in in a hurry. Um, I don't see Gaslam being the one to d- dethrone Whitaker, but uh, Adesanya, Pohachina, those guys specifically, yeah, I see them really piecing up. Whitaker. I want to see that. I want to see Costa Adesanya. I mean, I was not going to see that fight next, but Jesus Christ, I'd love to see that fight now. I mean, who does he fight next? I mean, where does he go next? Uh, well, the rumor's been Bohachina versus Romero on Fox. Oh, not Fox, sorry, ESPN uh, in 2019. Oh, oh, so, oh, that's a good, I want to see that fight. So now. those two guys are off the table, theoretically. Um, you know, I don't think you throw him in with a Jared Cannonier who picked up a win against Eric Branch. That's too low level. Um, maybe, Luke Rock, maybe Luke Rockhold. I've seen that name sort of thrown out there. Um do you not think, do you not think, right, I mean, he's just beat Weidman, but do you not think, okay, um, you know, he's, he's lost to these guys, he's just beat Weidman, um, do we want to put him straight in with a win of this fight now, or do we put him in there with Adesanya? I mean, obviously that fight might not happen, but is there a possibility that they might put him in there with Jacques Ray next? There is a possibility, especially from a timing standpoint, because obviously um, the the Whitaker Gaston fight, I believe, is in February. So in terms of, like, turnaround, it's absolutely possible Adesanya and Jack Ray can get it together and put it together on that card specifically. That that could absolutely happen. Um, I remember, I think I heard, I heard Adesanya talking about like taking a little mini vacation. I could have been wrong about that. I could have misheard him. Um, if that's the case, which I don't blame him, he's fought a, an insane amount of times this year in a very short amount of time this year. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's really Rockhold, Jack Ray, or a title shot. Um, or you wait for the winner of uh, a Boa Gina Romero fight or something along that line. Um, you know, in a perfect world, if Gegard Musasi was back in the UFC, Musasi versus Adesanya would have been the fight. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I mean, I mean, the middle way that now he's in a situation right where he's just beat Bronson, uh, and the only way is up. And when you're talking about the only way is up, it's rock cold, Jacare. Those guys, so it's gonna it's gonna have to do one thing. It's anything else is a step back. So yeah, I agree. And, and just again, shout out to Adesanya. Look great. Definitely a a star on the rise. If you are just a boxing fan out there listening to the show, go check out highlight videos on YouTube. You will not be disappointed. Trust me. Go check out some interviews of him. You will also not be disappointed. He is utterly entertaining in and outside of the cage. Um, I loved his um his little dance he did after the fight. I loved that. Like the guy's just, he's just got, he's just got charisma all over him. Mate. You know, when he spoke about, you know, it was a walk in the garden. I mean, the guy knows how to cut a promo. The guy's just got it all right. He's just a full package. That was so good. When he says a walk in park, no, a garden. And he looked at the camera kind of sly. And luckily, people in the arena sort of got it. Like the people weren't drunk enough to not get it. So everyone sort of laughed and cheered for it. You're right. The guy cuts a promo naturally. And that is. You can't teach that. Like, you can't teach stardom, and he has that. Uh, and also, you can't, I mean, in terms of striking prowess, there is really no one else in the UFC right now that has that level of skill as Adesanya, in my opinion. Briefly, though, just to sort of uh, contextualize the top 10, uh, Robert Whitaker as obviously the champion, Romero, Luke Rockhold, Wyman, Gaslam, Jacare, uh, obviously he beat Brunson, David Branch just lost, Paul Hachina, and then Adesanya. There is really no one else for him other than a Rockhold, uh, Jacare, or wait for the winner of uh, Whitaker or Gaslam. Maybe they give it to him over Jacare. Who knows? This is the UFC. Um, you know, they did sort of fast forward the Darren Till, you know, you know, movement in a way and throw him in a towel shot maybe a little bit early. I can see them doing that with Adesane. I mean, I, I just being honest, it's the UFC and the WME era. They do some stupid shit. Um, any other? Also, Sorry, no, I, was, I just wanted to add that. I'm just kind of going off top, but I heard I read on Twitter that the UFC thing they're doing Robbie Lawler against Stephen Thompson. I think they're doing Asker against Till. I'm not too sure what the what the, what the kind of uh, actual you know seriousness is behind that, but I kind of like the idea of Asker against Till. I actually like that fight. I don't know what about you? I don't, because I'm never really a fan of a guy coming off a loss fighting a guy trying to get a championship shot like that just never makes sense to me especially in the UFC like in boxing it may happen a little bit more but uh in in the UFC I feel like that just shouldn't be happening um 
You know, I, I feel like if, if you're a Darren Till, you come off your first, not first career loss. Uh, no, yeah, his first career loss uh, against, you know, a, a guy like Woodley and you're utterly dominated in the fight. Why would you go fight a guy like Ben Askren who obviously has the skills to sort of tap into your flaws? It just makes no sense to me. I would like to see Darren Till plus move up to middleweight. Uh, I think he cuts way too much weight to get to 170. Um, a 185 Darren Till is much more exciting in my opinion. Yeah, I'll see your point. I'll see your point with that. Cam, any uh, last thoughts on this card uh, or at all? Because we're about to wrap up. Nah, man. I was quite surprised Branch lost, uh, to be honest with you. I actually was surprised about that. Um, but other than that, no, I thought this, the card was solid. Um, considering if you look at the, the, the travesty around the whole card that was happening for ages, you know, they couldn't get a main event. Diaz Pore was off. I thought the card was, wasn't that bad, to be honest with you. I agree. Like, uh, obviously, we didn't really touch on like uh, the Jared Cannonier fight versus David Branch as much. Like you said, um, great performance on Jared Cannonier. Really sort of revitalized his career and put him on a real like top ten, top ten, top fifteen stage. Uh, shout out to him. Uh, Carl Robeson picked up a real dominant win against Jack Martian. Uh, Sajara Eubanks obviously picked up a win against Roxanne Martafer. Sajara Eubanks was originally supposed to main event this card. Thank God that did not happen. Sorry, Sajara, you just did not belong in in that. Uh, level uh jordan rinaldi picked up a, a win against jason knight oh that was that was tough to see man i've always been a fan of jason knight shaman mariah is picking up a win against julio arce which is perhaps one of the bloodiest fights in ufc history go check it out good friend lyman good uh defeated ben saunders via ko in the first round lyman good if you do not know him always a fun fighter in mma and plus if you do not know in your box if you're not the listening a guy that trains with marcus brown and that team on the regular and I have seen them spar quite often, and that is, uh, that's almost worth money right there. Uh, shout out to Jane, uh, Shane Borgos as well, another one of those guys in the Lyman Good, uh, Tiger Schumann, uh, Jim, another guy that sort of comes over to the Marcus Brown, um, sort of stable and go train with them, uh, train with Andre Rozier, uh, Gary Starks, that whole group, uh, Sergey Devachenko, all those guys, they all train together. Shout out to those guys and that old whole conglomerate over there in New York City. Um, but other than that, not not much else to say. Uh, like Cam said, uh, we're gonna be back tomorrow, same time as usual, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. We won't be delayed at all uh, for tomorrow's show. Again, sorry about today's. There was a, a little health concern, obligation for a family member I had to deal with. But anyways, um, what else? Oh, tomorrow, it's very, it's a U.S. thing. I know Cam doesn't care, but it's voting day in the U.S. Go out there and vote. I voted by mail a week ago. Get on it. Uh, don't miss the show for it, though, so make sure you do it early or after. Uh, get on, Miss MCR, but make sure you go vote. Whoever you want to vote for, go do it. Um, anyways, I'm Matt, the Hipster Hunter. Uh, be back tomorrow. Mix Comet Radio. Hit the like button. Share the show. Subscribe. And have a great day. Peace. <laughs>